Hello, this is CJ Hoyle. This here is my linear limo recumbent bike, which I assembled back in March of 2019. I have a full video where I demonstrated how I assembled this bike using parts which came from an older linear recumbent bike, which I installed onto a brand new frame. In the two years since I completed that project, I've ridden this bike almost 10,000 kilometers. In this video, I'm gonna provide an update on this bike and show all the things that I've changed on it during my two years of ownership. I'm also going to show a couple of things which are currently broken on this bike which need to be fixed. So let's start off by talking about the crank set. When I first assembled this bike, I used these cranks which came from my existing linear. Something that I found with that old bike, which also carried over to this new bike, is that occasionally when I'd be riding, particularly when climbing steep hills, I would find that I'd get some soreness in my knees. I thought that maybe if I was able to gear the bike down even lower for climbing hills, this might help. The easiest way to do that is to change this smallest chain ring here to an even smaller one. But as you can see, the chain rings on this crank set are riveted in place and not designed to be swappable. Meanwhile, I also read that other people who had experienced knee soreness when riding recumbent bikes were able to solve this problem by switching to cranks, which were shorter. My existing cranks were 160 millimeters long. So I ordered these cranks, which are 152. These cranks also have the added benefit of having smaller chain rings. The smallest chain ring on my existing crank set was 28 teeth, where this one has 24 teeth. So this means when climbing a steep hill, I can gear down 14% lower to hopefully further reduce the strain on my knees. So after installing these shorter cranks onto the bike, they seem to make a positive improvement for my knees, so I left them on there and continued to use them. A little over a year later though, I started to notice a funny sound coming from that area of my bike. That noise was caused by the sprockets, which had become loose from the crank. As far as I can tell, there's no way to fix that because these two pieces are held together by some kind of a crimp. Now to be fair, these are really inexpensive cranks made by a brand I'd never heard of before called Action. The reason I went with such inexpensive cranks was because I bought them mostly as an experiment because I was unsure if shorter cranks would solve my knee soreness problem. However, now that I can confidently say that these dimensions of cranks work for me successfully, I was happy to invest in a better quality set of 152 millimeter cranks, which are what you can see installed here now. These cranks are made by a company called Lasco, and they have chain rings which are actually replaceable. I installed these towards the end of last summer, and so far I've been really happy with them. To accommodate this particular set of cranks, I also needed to replace my existing bottom bracket with one which had a shorter spindle. This was worthwhile to do anyways though, because this bottom bracket has already seen a lot of kilometers. A few months after I replaced my crank set for the first time, I also replaced my cassette. This is my existing cassette, and I opted to replace it with one which has an even bigger lowest chain ring, once again to help me gear the bike down extra low for when climbing steep hills and carrying a heavy load. At the same time, I also replaced the chain on this bike. Now obviously a standard bike chain is not long enough to fit on this bike, but I was able to buy two chains and stitch them together and it worked out to be the exact right length. I felt really lucky that it worked out this way because if I needed it to be a little bit longer, then I would have needed to buy a third chain only to use a few links from it. This is the model of the chain that I bought and my only complaint has been that it seems to be a lot more noisy than the chain that I had before it. I've also replaced the rear cargo rack on this bike. Back on the first day of my May 2019 bike tour, the old rack that I had unfortunately failed down here. In the parking lot of a small town hardware store, I was able to repair it by epoxying some steel rods inside these aluminum tubes, and that got me through the remainder of the trip with no further problems. But before my next bike trip, I wanted a new cargo rack that I could rely on. I decided on an Axiom Journey Unifit Chromo rack, which is actually made out of chromoly steel rather than aluminum. It's a bit more heavy than my existing rack, but steel is more resistant to fatigue than aluminum, so hopefully this rack will be more reliable. I also like how it has this second set of rails down here, which means I can mount my panniers lower down here, and when I mount my tent on top here, the tent doesn't interfere with the panniers at all. In order to mount this standard off-the-shelf rack to this abnormal bike, 
The metal rods which came with it, which are designed to connect the rack from there to the rest of the bike, were not long enough, but I was able to find these old steel rods that I had, which just so happened to be the right length and the right diameter to work with the connectors. I also had to make this plate here because these pieces were actually designed to be mounted into these holes, but I had to space them further out so they wouldn't interfere with the fender and the tire. This new rack has been completely problem free since I installed it. When I'm doing a bike tour, I use this rack for carrying my waterproof panniers, but for running errands around the city, I prefer to use a milk crate. Shortly after I got this new rack, I came up with a new way of mounting a milk crate onto a bike, which holds it on there very securely, and yet it's also very quick and easy to take it on and off of the bike. So as you may have guessed, this milk crate is fastened in place by bungee cords, but there are also these plastic shoes fastened to the bottom of it, which anchor it in one spot and stop it from sliding around. I have a separate video on YouTube where I demonstrated doing the exact same thing with the milk crate on my other linear recumbent bike. Speaking of these panniers, last year I made a video where I demonstrated how to make a replacement part for this piece here, which had broken, and I used the 3D printer at my local library to make it. Sadly, before I had a chance to test out these panniers on another bike tour, I discovered that the piece that I made got broken when I placed something heavy on top of it. As I discussed in the video, I'm pretty confident that my replacement part is strong enough for the task that it was intended for, but it obviously wasn't strong enough for a heavy force pressing it in this direction here. To avoid this getting broken in the future, I've considered taking the file that I used to print this and sending it to a company to print it out in a different type of plastic because my local library only allowed me to print it in PLA, which is not known to be a particularly strong type of plastic. Another option is for me to try and fabricate a metal replacement part using a piece of sheet metal. So while we're at this end of the bike, let's talk about the rear tire next. When I first assembled this bike, I used a tire that I had from my old 700C hybrid bike. This tire already had a lot of distance on it when I installed it, so it didn't take very long for it to start to wear out. Eventually when it did, I switched to the matching tire which came from that same hybrid bike. Eventually when this one wore out too, I bought a new tire for it. The tire I chose is a Continental Contact Plus 700 by 35 c I chose it because it's got a smooth tread and it's also relatively wide at 35 millimeters. Having a wider rear tire kind of acts like a suspension, which is important when you're riding a recumbent bike because you stay seated 100% of the time and it's really nice to have the tire soaking up some of the bumps rather than your spine. The next part I replaced on this bike was the steering linkage. This part connects the handlebars to the front fork, allowing you to steer from back here using the underseat steering. It's an extremely important part because if it were to ever fail while you were riding the bike, the consequences could be catastrophic. Throughout its life, the parts of the existing steering linkage had become bent a few times. I remember one of the times when the bike got knocked over by somebody else when I had it locked up at a bike rack. Each time that the steering linkage got bent, I always very carefully did my best to straighten it, but you can only do that so many times. Now it's possible to order a new one of these from Linear, but when you factor in duty and shipping from the United States, it becomes a pretty expensive part. But if you look at it closely, a steering linkage is mostly comprised of two pieces of off-the-shelf metal with a bunch of holes drilled and threads topped in either ends to accept a quick-release ball stud. So I decided to try fabricating my own steering linkage using pieces of metal of the same size from a local metal supplier. I actually made two of them, so I'll have a spare for the future. The only main difference between mine and the original was that the original had the outer piece of tubing made out of aluminum, where mine's made out of stainless steel. Stainless steel is stronger, but also heavier, so there's a trade-off. The reason I went with this, though, was simply because the metal supply place didn't have any aluminum of this dimension in stock at the time. All in all, I'm really happy with how my homemade steering linkage turned out. Another very minor change that I made to the bike around the same time was replacing the old worn out grip tape with this soft foam tape. Also at around the same time, I replaced the old plastic body pedals with these metal ones. While I'm up here at the front of the bike, let's also talk about this thing. In my original video about this bike, I briefly showed this custom bracket that I made 
for mounting an action camera onto the front of the bike. This was the very first of my 3D printing projects that I designed and printed at my local library. In the two years since I made it, I've used it to record 38 bike riding videos for YouTube. The only issue that I've had with this bracket was that one time when I was installing it onto the bike, I over tightened these bolts, which caused this part of it to delaminate from the rest of it. When I was printing this part, I oriented it in this direction here, so the 3D printer laid its layers down in this direction like this, which I think means that the part has low tensile strength in this direction here. So I tried gluing this part back together, but of course it split a second time. So when I glued it together again, this time I added these wood screws, which reinforces it in that weak direction, and since then it hasn't given me any problems. The final changes to this bike that I'm going to talk about are with the seat. Back when I had this seat on my previous linear, one day I hit a big bump and the bottom of the seat collapsed. Three of the four welds which held the bottom of the seat in place failed all at the same time, and based on the way that they failed, I'm pretty sure that those welds were already fatigued. After several unreturned emails and phone calls, I was eventually able to find a shop that was willing to weld my seat back together for me. It was pretty expensive and far away for me to travel to, and only a few months later, I started to see fatigue cracks starting to form in those brand new welds. My short term repair was to borrow the very similar seat frame from my 1992 Iowa linear recumbent and install it onto this bike, but sadly when I was doing my May 2019 bike tour, this seat frame failed in very much the same way. So obviously these welded seat bottoms don't seem to be very reliable, and at this point I really wasn't keen on getting either of my two broken seats re-welded, only for the welds to potentially fail again in the future. The temporary solution that I came up with was to add a single crossbar along the back of the seat and create a seat bottom using a lattice of rope. I wasn't totally happy with this repair, but I did continue to use it on this bike for the next year or so. Meanwhile, when it came time to fix the seat for my 1992 Iowa linear recumbent, I decided to try something different. I started with a thicker plate of aluminum than the seat originally had, and I attached it to the seat frame using fasteners rather than getting it welded. I added these two bends to the aluminum plate, which allow it to be bolted here and here, but there are also three machine screws on either side, which fasten the aluminum plate to the aluminum tubing. I knew that since aluminum is a relatively soft material, that if I simply tried to thread my machine screws directly into the aluminum, that there's a good chance it wouldn't have been strong enough. So I used these things, which are called cross dowels instead. Each cross dowel got inserted into the open ends of the tube up here, which made them drop down into here, and then from the outside using a strong magnet, I positioned each cross dowel over top of the appropriate hole. I then carefully inserted each machine screw up through the hole and rotated them into the threaded hole on the inside of the cross dowel. The round shape of the cross dowel up against the round shape on the inside of the tube is what kept it from spinning when I was tightening it on. Now I'll admit that getting all six of these threaded in place was a pretty finicky and time consuming process, but I don't ever plan on unthreading them again. So it was worth it for the one time effort, considering how strong a bond this makes compared to the alternative. So I completed my repair to the seat on this bike back in the fall of 2019. And after riding this bike several hundred kilometers with no issues, I decided to do away with the lattice of rope that I had on this bike and repeat the same style of repair to fix the seat on this bike too. So as you can see, the seat on this bike now has a metal plate attached to the bottom of it, which is held in place entirely with fasteners and no welts. Interestingly, this particular seat had its original seat plate welded on the top of it, where my gold linear seat had it originally welded on the bottom. The reason why I decided to repair this one with the seat plate on the bottom was because I already knew that my repair had been successful on the other one, but also because with the seat plate on the bottom, there's an extra little gap in here, which means you can add an extra piece of foam in here, which goes underneath of the main seat cushion and makes the seat more comfortable. So since repairing this seat last August, I really haven't made any other changes to the bike since then. There are, however, a couple of minor things which are currently broken on the bike, and I'm considering showing those repairs in a future video. First of all is this front fender. At some point this fender got caught on something, 
which caused it to crack here, and that crack eventually expanded until this piece eventually just fell off. I already bought a front 20 inch fender to install in its place. Second is this bracket here, which came with my previous linear, which is used for holding accessories that you would normally mount on your handlebars, such as this bracket, which is used for holding my Garmin GPS unit. Recently, this piece here got broken off, and I'm not sure where I'd buy another one to replace it. However, I've always felt that having this bar here attached to this pivoting arm here seemed kind of unnecessary for my purposes, and I'd be completely okay if this bar was just somehow rigidly fastened on there. So I'm considering redesigning this bracket somehow. And the final repair that's needed is to patch this small hole here in the seat fabric. Over the years, I've done a lot of repairs to the fabric part of this seat, and I probably eventually should just get around to buying or remaking the entire fabric for the seat. But until I get around to that, adding a small patch over this small hole here shouldn't be too much effort. I've already got some fabric, which is a really close match to the original material, and all I need to do is cut out a small patch here and sew it over the hole. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this little update video on my main bicycle here. Hopefully there's some tips in there that will be helpful to other linear owners, but even if you don't own a linear recumbent bike, hopefully you still got something out of this video. If you watched it all the way to the end, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below, and thanks for watching.